Hi, my name is Chris Sloan. I'm a PhD student here at Oakland University working with Dr. Pandey in the area of design optimization. But I also have about going on 30 years of industrial exper uh, experience also. Um, I started out as a consultant um, doing design work for um, consumer products, <clears throat> then moved to automotive and, and uh, took on a number of different assignments in product development, uh, durability testing, crash testing, and now I'm in manufacturing where I'm a manager of uh, dimensional engineering group. Um, I'm going to be talking about tolerance analysis, and this is a very simple tool used in design development um, to make sure that assembly uh, specifications um, meet the requirements based on the tolerance is applied to the components. Um, I'll go in a little bit into the nuts and bolts of um, tolerance analysis, but the more important uh, thing I want to go into is the context of how we use tolerance analysis and how we use that to make predictions that facilitate decisions and how those predictions are based on models and how we accommodate uncertainty in those models. I'll go through a whole structure of that, but I, I just want to introduce that idea. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, though, is two different modes of uh, addressing problems. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the plant, and typically what we're doing is we're fixing problems. So we're, there's many different methods for problem solving in the plant, um, but all of them cost money because by the time we're, we're solving problems, we're dealing with basically a bad design that doesn't accommodate the current conditions, the uncertainty that's happened since the design was developed. Um, this uh, uh, leads to losses and waste in the plant. Now, where we'd like to be is somewhere in the future avoiding problems, and that's based on a good design. And a good design is robust to uncertainty, and it actually prevents loss and waste. So, in one mode, and it will always be there, in the plant we're in a reactive mode, where we're fixing problems because they don't meet requirements. In the proactive mode, which is in the design mode, we are avoiding problems and making good design decisions. So keep those two ideas in mind. What we want to do is uh, optimize the amount of money we make in our manufacturing process by making the design robust to uncertainty so that we don't have those losses and waste. So how do we get to a good design? Let me walk you through a few of the dependencies on a good design. The first thing is that we make decisions about the design. Those decisions are based on how we want the uh, design or, of the product or the process to perform. We make those decisions based on predictions. We choose among the alternatives we have based on predictions of how they're going to behave. Those predictions come from a model. And we'll get into some details about models, but let's just say at this point it's a way to represent reality. That model has to accommodate uncertainty. Um, when we're talking about the future, there's a lot of things that could happen. We have to be able to quantify and understand what those possibilities, what those possible outcomes are. Now this is where tolerance analysis fits in. It's looking at our design and being able to accommodate the design specific, uh, accommodate uncertainty in the design specifications. And there's two ways we're going to look at that. One is through statistics and the other is through Monte Carlo's uh, simulation. So let's start with a decision. So a decision, as you know, is an irre irrevocable commitment of resources. And why is it irrevocable? It's because when, once we take that step, once we leap off the cliff, the only way to go back is to spend more money, to commit more resources, to change that decision. So the question is, is the, is the decision good or bad? And one possible landing in this scenario, if you take the plunge, is that you're, you're jumping into deep water. That's great. You've, you've minimized the, the possibility of a poor outcome and maximized the possibility of a good outcome. Now, if you know that the uh, outcome, the probability of the outcome is, is bad, you're going to avoid that decision. So whether you have deep water or rocks, you're going to make two different decisions. A good decision will maximize the probability of a good outcome. A bad decision will not. So how do we make good decisions? How do we, how do we um, understand what the uh, probability of the future outcomes are? 
So what we need is a prediction. We need to be able to forecast the future. What are the, the possible outcomes and what are the probabilities that those outcomes will occur? Now the simplest way to think of this is in terms of I have a current state, uh, a this state, and I'm going to proceed to a that state. So if this, then that. It's a very simple idea. Um, and the decision I make now is the this, the parameters that I'm specifying. The, the outcome later is the design performance. And what I need is a prediction of the, de the decisions I make now, what the outcome will be. So let's look at a kind of silly example. My decision is, should I pour my beer into my glass? Um, there are some possible outcomes of this. One is that all the beer is going to fit in the glass, which is great. The other is that there's too much beer and it's going to overflow. I have a good outcome and a bad outcome. Now, my decision based on those outcomes is if I know the beer is going to fit, I will decide to pour the beer. If I know it's not going to fit, I'll probably decide not to pour the beer. Well, actually, I will decide to pour the beer, but I'll take other uh, accommodations. So I might have more napkins, or I might pour half the beer, drink some of it, and then pour the rest of the beer. But the, the point is, I will be making an informed decision about what's going to happen in the future. So how do I do that? How do I make those predictions? I create a model. And let's talk about what a model is. Um, it's a systematic represent representation of reality um, that allows us to uh, look at specific characteristics of reality and make predictions based on that. So we create the model, we push it forward in time, and we see what the outcomes are. Now, models can be a number of different types. And I think everybody has an idea of what a model is, but let's look at some of the ranges of things we, that are really models. So the first one you might be familiar with is a prototype. You develop a design, you need to know how, how it's going to perform into the future. So you actually build a prototype. It might not be the entire uh, design. It might be representative of certain parts of the design. Um, I think you're all familiar with crash test dummies, what are called ATDs, anthropomorphic test devices. These are models that will predict the behavior of a human body in a vehicle crash. Um, if you've ever taken a, a chemistry class, um, I'm sure you've worked with the little tinker toy models that are spheres that re represent uh, atoms and little pins that connect them that represent the um, relationships between those atoms. Now, obviously, we um, can't uh, actually sense how molecules behave, but we use a model to represent how they behave, react with each other, or react to certain um, conditions. Others, of course, are analytical. And this is a very simple idea. Um, if you can represent a system with a mathematical equation, and you can solve that equation, you can predict the outputs from the inputs. Um, visual representations of systems are also quite uh, common. I'm sure we've all worked with block diagrams, where we represent the components of a system and the arrows between those blocks are the relationships between the components. Um, computer models. Um, we all, I think most people, when they think of models, they think of computer simulations. Um, but in fact, most computer simulations are simply numerical methods to solve the analytical, the mathematical models. Um, another thing to think about is your household budget is actually a, a model. You use that, that spreadsheet to try to predict what your finances are going to be in the future how much money you're going to have to spend, how much money you're going to have to make to finance some of the things, the commitments you already have. So the, the idea of a model is, is very broad, so keep that in mind. Um, there are also two types of models. One is deterministic, where I know the, the uh, specific inputs and I get a specific set of outputs. Um, the other is, determ uh, is stochastic. Um, that's where the inputs have variability to them. There's uncertainty to the inputs. And consequently, I get uncertainty in the outputs. Now, the idea is that I can quantify both the inputs and the outputs, and that helps me make decisions about the future. So, how do we model reality? There's two basic ideas I want to get across. One is abstraction. Um, when we look at, at reality, there are a lot of details that, that um, come at us. Um, many of them are insignificant to the decision we make. So when we abstract, we eliminate those details from the model. Now, in the, in the case I have here, we all know this smiley face icon. 
Um, it's an abstraction of a face. We all know it's a face. We know it's missing a lot of details, but we all know it's a face. Now, we also generalize. We take um, representations of common things and we make statements that apply to those things across all those different manifestations of, of the abstraction. So in this case, we have many faces, and you can see that there's some commonalities among them. They all have two eyes that are rounded or oval. They all have a crescent-shaped mouth. Um, they all have hair to varying degrees. They all have at least a space for a nose. So you could say they have a nose all the way down to having no nose at all. That's generalization, taking these, these common statements and applying it across uh, different uh, items. Now, you might, might say that we're losing some information, and in fact we are, because, and that's a good thing, because if we have a model that's as complicated as reality, we might as well be start studying reality. The usefulness of a model is based on how well it abstracts and generalizes. And George Box said, essentially, all models are wrong, meaning they don't represent the, the reality perfectly, but they are useful. They give us very important insights into how reality works. So let's, let's apply this to a very real um, uh, scenario that I've encountered in my own uh, work. Um, here we have a Jeep Wrangler that's off-road. It's climbing over boulders. Kind of cool. Um, but it's also a very complicated engineering problem. When the front tire, that, that front left tire, goes over a boulder, it imparts a displacement to the whole system, um, which means the body and the person in the vehicle are going to get some kinds of forces applied to them. So how do we, how do we come up with a model for that? Let's, let's work through that. So if I look at this picture, um, I can see that there's all these coils in the suspension, uh, I, can, I can talk about some of the details of the number of coils, the diameter, the uh, diameter of the, of the wire in the coil. Um, I know that I have a shock inside that coil. Um, that has a certain orifice, metering pin, uh, cylinder diameter, um, and other details. This tire has moved a certain amount, um, so I can, I can look at the size of the boulder that's going over, the size of the tire, uh, the, dis the distance from the, of the tire axle to the, the body. Um, and I know that there's a lot of mass involved, there's a lot of weight in this thing. So I've got an engine block in the vehicle, I've got the body itself, I've got the passenger, I've got the weight of the tire. Um, I have all these details that confront me. How do I make a model out of this? Well, we take those details and, and we abstract them. We, t we get rid of the in in unimportant ones and we come up with a, with a very simple uh, abstraction. So, I know I have a spring in there, I know I have a shock in there, I know that I've got a displacement, and I know that I have some vehicle mass involved in this system. So I can generalize those, generalize those because I know how a spring behaves. It's based on the uh, coefficient of stiffness of the spring. I know how a shock behaves. It has to do with the, the dampening coefficient. I know displacement, that's just a characteristic of space. I know how to measure that. Um, and I know vehicle mass. I, I know mass is just a characteristic of, of um, matter, and I can generalize uh, that behavior. So from this, I can come up with a lot of different representations of this system. The first one, if you've taken high school physics, you might recognize as a free body diagram. It simply shows the components of the system and how they interact. The second one is the math model. This is probably the most important one. Um, it's the mass times acceleration is equal to the, the sum of the uh, dampening coefficient times the velocity and the spring constant times the displacement. Um, implicit in here, by the way, is another variable called time. Um, we're going to stick with the, the Newtonian definition of time just because it's easier. Einstein kind of screwed things up in that. Um, we can also take that math model and um, represented in a visual model, which is a graph of the displacement over time. So I can take this very complicated system, I can abstract the components of it, generalize about those components, and then start whittling down to a model that I can actually um, um, handle and work with. So how would I do that with my, my beer example? Um, let's, let's go through that a little bit at a time. So the first thing is the, the beer itself. 
Um, there's a lot of characteristics of, of that liquid in the bottle. Um, first of all, we know it's a fluid. It has a certain temperature. It has density. It's compressible. It has a certain taste. Um, any number of things. And now I've got a glass. Um, it has a shape. It has a color. It's made of certain material. Um, it has certain weight. I can go through and list hundreds of characteristics of these items, but that doesn't help me any on to generalize. So I'm going to I'm going to distill these ideas into an abstraction. I know that the fluid. I know how uh, that I can describe. Um, all of this with just the fact that it's a fluid. I can describe the glass by its geometry. Now once I have those two abstractions, I can generalize about the abstraction. So in terms of fluidity, I know that a fluid always takes the shape of the container it's in. And in terms of the container, I know the shape is just a truncated cone, and I can calculate the, the volume of that truncated cone. So once I've done that, I can now reduce this problem down to just some ge geometrical parameters. And if I can get a relationship between those, then I have a model of my beer pouring system. So if I walk through this model, I have my beer, I have my glass, I pour the beer into the glass, and I get some desired outcome. That is, all the beer fits in the glass. Now, ideally, for this condition to exist, the volume of the glass has to be greater than or equal to the volume of the beer. So how do I figure that out? Fortunately, I know some things about the geometry. Um, I can calculate the volume of the glass, and although the integral looks kind of complicated, it's actually quite simple. And I know the volume of the beer because it's, it's on the label of the beer bottle. Um, I can go through some of the relationships that I know exist in the glass. Um, this represents the radius as I move up the height. Here we have the difference between the height of the glass and the depth of the foam at the top, because if the foam is higher or lower, I can fit more or less beer in it. And then I know that the glass is six inches high, and my ideal uh, head depth is an inch. So if I use those parameters, I get this equation, and when I solve it, which is a fairly straight thing to do, I get that the volume of my glass is larger than the volume of my, my beer. Great. I can make a decision based on this. I know that pouring this beer into this glass is a good thing to do. It's going to fit. Now just to recap that. So I have two inputs, which is the height of my beer, which is actually a combination of the height of the glass and the depth of the, of the foam. I also have the volume of the beer. I have a relationship, a mathematical relationship, a condition that allows me to predict what's going to happen. If this statement is true, I get a success. I don't spill the beer. If it's false, I get beer overflowing in my glass. Now, uh, a famous mathematician said that if people do not believe mathematics is simple, it is only because they do not realize how complicated life is. And now what we've done <clears throat> is we've taken a complicated situation where we have a lot of uh, characteristics in our beer and our glass, and we've reduced it down to the ones that matter. And we have our, our simple math for it. But that's if everything is perfect. If I have a glass that's exactly six inches and I have a, a, a foam depth that's exactly one inch, then this model works. But I know that that doesn't always happen. Um, glasses are of different heights, maybe slight, only slightly varying. And I know foam, um, when I pour a beer, uh, varies wild, widely when I, when I pour it. So how do I accommodate that uncertainty in my parameters? So let's look at our, um, our model again. So I have the height of the glass. I know that if I do this over a, a number of glasses, I'm going to get some variation, which I'm going to represent as this histogram. And I'll also represent it as statistics over a population of glasses. Um, I've, I've taken hundreds of glasses, I've measured them, and I know that on the average, they're six inches in height. Um, I know that the measure of the variation, which I'm going to call variance, is 0 0.0025 inches, which is, which is tiny, but it exists. Now, the depth of the, of the foam when I pour the beer, that also has a certain amount of variation. Ideally, I'd like it to be an inch deep, so I can, I can aim for that as an average. Um, but I know I have variation, depending on, on um, how quickly I pour the beer, how much beer I've drunk since then. Um, those kinds of things affect how much foam is going to uh, appear in the, in the glass. 
So again, I, I characterize it by the mean value and the spread of that with the variance um, uh, parameter or the statistic. Now, I want to know actually this distance, this height here. That is actually a combination. If I have a taller glass, I'm going to be able to fit more beer. If I have deeper foam, I'm not going to be able to fit as much beer. So I need to be able to calculate the variation of this level of beer that's, that's possible. So I can actually do that analytically. And we'll talk a little bit about this in a couple other slides. Um, but I don't have to, because I, I have another method to do that. Um, just for, for reference, when I add um, the means of two random variables, which is the height of the glass, and in this case, a negative, which is the depth of the, of the uh, foam, the mean is simply the, the sum of the two random variable means. Um, and in terms of variance, the variance of this height is just the sum of the two variances. That's very simple because I've got a simple model. I'm just adding the two random variables. The other random variable I have in the system is the beer in, in, the, gla in the bottle itself. Now, the label says 12 ounces, uh, but I know that that's never exactly right because it's part of a manufacturing process where they fill these bottles. So, uh, just for fun, I'm going to say that um, the bottles actually vary from 11.5 to 12.5 ounces in a uniform distribution. That is, it's equally um, likely that I'll get any value within that, that uh, range. So, we go back to our math model, and we, we can progress through this just the same way. The volume of my glass has to be greater than the volume of my beer. I do the calculation, I come up with a mathematical expression, but my H, the height of my beer, and the V, the volume of the beer going into the glass, are random variables now. How do I calculate this when H can be anything within a certain range, and so can V? So I have a problem now. How do I solve this equation when I've got random variables in the equation? There's, a, there's an analytical way to do it, which is very complicated in terms of the math. I'm going to avoid that uh, for this uh, talk. Um, but there's a, there's a more sort of direct way, which is called Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo, of course, is a great place for casinos, for gambling. Uh, that's where the name comes from. Um, but what it basically means is I can simulate a sample of uh, inputs that represent the distribu an assumed distribution. So in this case, remember, I said the glass had a mean of 6 and a variance of 0 0.0025. It, simply using Excel, I can generate numbers that represent that distribution. In this case, I generated a sample of 100 glass uh, heights that averages 6 and has a variance of 0 0.025. I also did the same thing for the head depth. The average is 1 inch and the variance is 0 0.0625, which is what we, we specified. So I have all these numbers, and at each, each row, I can subtract one from the other, and I get the height of my beer. So you'll see that on the average, it's 5, and the variance is 0 0.0662. That kind of proves, it's not exact, but it's, it's an approximate way to, do, to solve that, that um, first uh, equation where I have to add the height of the beer and the height of the foam. Um, now, I can also simulate the volume of beer in the uh, beer bottle. I can take those and I can um, subtract one from the other and also uh, putting in a factor to convert the height of the glass or the volume of the glass to ounces. Um, and I can determine what the overflow will be. A negative number will, will be an overflow, a positive will be um, uh, it fits. I can take those values and put them in a histogram and I can see the, the probability of having an overflow uh, beer pour. Now, from the numbers, I can tell that about 82% of the time, the beer is going to fit in that type of glass. And if you think about that, if you've ever poured a beer, that sounds about right. Um, sometimes there's, there's a small percentage of times where you have to adjust how you're pouring the beer because it's, it's going to overflow. So, we've talked about how to develop a good design. We start with a decision. That's based on predictions. Predictions come from a model. The model accommodates uncertainty. 
And from that, we can take the uncertainty of the components, predict the uncertainty of the uh, assembly, and through statistics and Monte Carlo simulation, we've arrived at, at tolerance analysis. So here I want to talk about a real example. This is a real engineering problem, but it uses the same, uh, the same approach that we did in the silly uh, uh, example of pouring beer into a glass. In this case, I have this assembly where a tang goes into a clevis. The, the green part is the tang, the um, blue part is the clevis. This is something you'd find in a suspension uh, connection, for example. Um, I need this green part to always fit inside the blue part, but I can't have it um, so much, uh, so I can't have the fit so loose that they kind of rattle together. I have to have the gap between these less than two millimeters. So if I look at that example, and if you think about how we fit the beer into the glass, I can use the same approach to determine what this gap will be and whether it will meet my requirement of less than two millimeters. And all I do in that is I, I have an estimation of the variation of the tang, and I can determine what the mean of the variation, I'm sorry, what the mean of the clevis dimension needs to be to fit the tang into the clevis. So you can see how we take that tolerance analysis, we apply it to the component specifications to make sure that the system specifications are met. Now, if I when I uh, do that last problem and I, and I solve that, that solution, this represents the distribution of the gap. Um, now, the capability of this particular uh, design is very low. The CP is 0.67. Typically, um, we're aiming for a CP of, of 1 or greater. Now, what this tells me is that um, my design is not capable. If I choose the wrong parameters, no matter what I do in the assembly plant, this uh, system will not work a certain percentage of the time. I'll have some that don't fit, and I'll have some that have a, a gap that's too wide. So, again, we went through a good design comes from decisions up front, based on predictions from a model with uncertainty. And we can develop the tolerance analysis on the uncertainty based on statistics or Monte Carlo simulation. So what we did there is we wanted to develop the design so that we avoided problems in the future, as opposed to having a poor design and then having to fix the problem in our production plant. So I, I hope that was um, informative. Um, what I've gone through um, is supplementary to class material. Um, none of this is going to be on a test. Let me repeat that. None of this is going to be on a test. Um, but I wanted to give you some context for some of the ideas that you see in class and how they apply to real engineering applications. Um, if you have any questions or would want to talk to me about some of these ideas, um, I can be reached at my email, which is on the screen, um, and I would love to talk to you about it. Thanks for your attention.